In a land of mighty rivers, lazy bayous, woodlands, wetlands, and underwater gardens, the bounty of nature comes alive in America's Delta. From neighborhood streets to the wild deep, trek along with scientists as they strive to bring the Louisiana black bear back from the brink of extinction. We cannot stand by and watch the obliteration of any species. Follow those on the forefront of the recovery effort. It's like a secret that only the bears knew, you know, for a long time, but now we'll know. Face unexpected challenges. I think I can do it real fast, but I don't worry about it. I'll worry about this coach getting squished. Amidst unpredictable elements. I'm sure. See how far they've come and how far they'll go to save one of America's most iconic and beloved wild animals. Black Bear Comeback. This program was made possible by the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, keeping our wildlife resources healthy for future generations. Wildlife matters. And by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Once abundant throughout Louisiana, southern Mississippi, and eastern Texas, Louisiana black bears were nearly lost forever. One of 16 subspecies of American black bear, known as Ursus americanus luteolus. These shy but curious bears are surprisingly good climbers and one of the world's most adaptable species. But human disturbance, habitat destruction, and overhunting took their toll. And by the late 1950s, only 80 to 120 were thought to remain in the state. By the time they were listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in 1992, more than 80% of their bottomland forest habitat had been cleared to make way for agriculture and urbanization. Wildlife is an indicator of quality of life. So when we start seeing species get into trouble, it's an indicator that maybe we need to look at the big picture and the system and, and things that are going wrong. Seeing their decline as a wake-up call, an unprecedented alliance of divergent stakeholders came to the table in search of solutions. Now, thanks to the collective efforts of the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Black Bear Conservation Coalition, and hundreds of private citizens and landowners, they're on the road to recovery. Navigating that road, however, has had its share of challenges. I thought we were supposed to have a northwest wind. No, we don't. Well, thank you. Our wind's not good. Dr. Obvious. You know, when I was a kid growing up, I, there was never any doubt that I would work with animals in some form or fashion. There was just never any other option for me. It's spring. The time wildlife biologist Maria Davidson, Travis Trant, and Matthew McAllister look forward to all year, den season. Using radio telemetry collars, they sneak up on previously captured and collared bears and attempt to tranquilize them in order to handle their cubs and collect biological data. Today, they're at Red River Wildlife Management Area in search of bear number 89, whom they've been monitoring since birth. She's either gonna hold or she's not. Yeah. Tracking bears is much simpler with the help of new technology but trapping them has never been easy. And one hunting story became the stuff of legend. Well, Theodore Roosevelt was a big hunter, as most people know. And in 1902, he came down and they hunted hard on horseback with dogs uh, for several days uh, in Tensaw Madison parishes in Louisiana and never could find a bear and ended up crossing the river and hunting uh, north of Vicksburg, their guide old black gentleman named Holt Collier found an old female bear, tied her to a tree, and then they sent word for the president to come so he could shoot the bear. President Roosevelt thought it unsportsmanlike and refused. A political cartoon by Clifford Berryman called Drawing the Line in Mississippi satirized the hunt, which spread like wildfire in the press. Inspired by the story, New York shop owners Morris Mitchum and his wife created the stuffed toy bear and requested the president's permission to name it Teddy's Bear. Roosevelt agreed, and the teddy bear was born, becoming a beloved childhood treasure to this day. 
Much has changed since that fateful hunt. This time-honored heritage, along with the hundreds of millions of conservation dollars it generates, fade with each passing year. But innovative programs like those offered by the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries are giving women, children, and people from all walks of life unique opportunities to experience and reconnect with the natural world. I think it's real important that we pass it on to our kids. It is a, a tradition that's been on the decline and we need to bring it back. I love it. I mean, it's my passion, actually. Lean forward, take a breath. Okay, take your shot. Hunter education is very important. Not only does it teach you what you need to know, what the law mandates and what you need to do, it gives you the tools that you need to be safe in the outdoors. So we teach gun safety skills. We teach management, conservation. We teach ethics. But people have much still to learn. This was one of two bears found shot to death within a week. For centuries, bears were harvested for their meat, oil, and skins, as well as for sport, contributing to their dramatic decline. Though federally protected for over two decades, illegal kills still occur, despite steep penalties of up to $35,000 and six months in jail. So public awareness is vital. You know, there's a fear because all they see on TV is sensationalized. They see a grizzly bear attack this person and they died. There's never been a case in the state of Louisiana that a Louisiana black bear ever attacked a human being, ever. If you encounter a bear within close proximity, speak calmly to let the bear know that you're a human and back away from the animal slowly. If he does approach you, stand your ground and use the bear spray if necessary. Never play dead. If in by chance you are attacked, fight back aggressively. Now, is that probably going to happen? No. We have a basic rule in wildlife. You hold your thumb out. If you could see that bear anywhere on the outside of that thumb, then you're too close. You need to get on out the way. Similar in size and sometimes mistaken for feral hogs, Louisiana black bears are black, but some have brown muzzles, and a few even have chest blazes. They range from three to six feet, nose to tail, and although they're not the biggest of the North American bears, they are the largest wild mammals in their range. You know, I've handled bears over 500 pounds, and in Louisiana, we have three different subpopulations. We have the Tensaw River population in Northeast Louisiana, we have the Upper Atchafalaya population, which is in Point Capee Parish, and then we have the coastal population, which is Iberia and St. Mary Parish. Adults usually range from 100 to well over 400 pounds. Their diet consists mainly of hard and soft mast, such as acorns, pecans, grasses, and berries, but they also forage for insects, corn, and other crops, and scavenge meat. And when given the opportunity, they make a beeline for trash, and sweets like donuts, for example. Bears are very secretive animals, and University of Tennessee graduate students, like Caitlin O'Connell, often have to bait them in order to conduct their research. This is a bear hair snare trap. The bears walk through the barbed wire and they'll leave a hair sample and then we come back and uh, collect the hair and we'll rebait it to hopefully catch them again. We work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on all of this research, and then we contracted our work to the University of Tennessee and USGS because they are the preeminent bear population modeling scientists out there. Though some of the tools of their trade might surprise you, these innovative techniques, along with advanced DNA technologies and telemetry, have revolutionized the way scientists study population and territorial trends. Hair snare sampling enables wildlife geneticists to identify individual bears, and GPS color studies are providing direction like never before. There are three recovery criteria in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's recovery plan that must be met before Louisiana black bears can be removed from the endangered species list. First, there have to be at least two viable subpopulations, one in the Tensaw River Basin and one in the Atchafalaya River Basin. Second, those two subpopulations must be connected by a corridor. And third, their habitat and the corridor have to be protected by a perpetual conservation easement. We wanted to let these bears explain to us in a way only they can what they believe constitutes a corridor. It's pretty exciting stuff. It's like a secret that only the bears knew, you know, for a long time, but now we'll know. 
and then we can build a model from that information and place it on a map and say, well, look, here's one, and here's one, and here's one. Like many people, some bears prefer to live along the coast. And there is growing concern among residents, especially in St. Mary and Iberia parishes, where they're getting a little too close for comfort. My name's Catherine Syracuse. I'm the Black Bear Conflict Officer for St. Mary Parish, and I'm riding through my normal neighborhood, my normal route, um, see any residents out and about. I usually stop, introduce myself, um, ask if they have any issues or problems. This area through here, you can see this is our perfect bear habitat back through here. And with these subdivisions situated around these habitats, that's why we have so many issues. The bears follow those wood lines and go in and out the, uh, the subdivisions. It's a ready-made smorgasbord for them. We have humans and animals vying for the same prime property. Human reluctance to adapt and coexist with bears is perhaps the greatest impediment to their recovery. So helping alleviate people's fears and getting the word out about how to keep bears off their property is crucial. You know, it's difficult for us as humans to decide, I'm not gonna put my bird feeder up, or I'm gonna do something special with my garbage so the bear can't get it. You know, human garbage has a very high calorie content, which is exactly what the bears are looking for. And when the proximity is such that, that a bear doesn't have to walk very far to get to that food source, you can hardly blame them. That's heavy duty plastic. That's some pretty serious, look at this. Look at the teeth marks right here. Uh-huh. I really don't let him worry me that much, but he's getting real comfortable, and he's getting on my porch, and I said, you know what, that's too close to home. <laughs> he just walks down the cement walkway to, to the gazebo like this, this is his place, you know? As bear populations increase, so do potential conflicts with humans. Bear-proof trash cans like these, employed throughout this small coastal town of Patterson, have helped drastically reduce the number of nuisance calls, but due to insufficient habitat and natural food sources, bears continue to frequent neighborhoods like these. When somebody calls and tells us they're having a problem with a bear, we have to do a couple of things. We have to talk to them long enough to figure out exactly what the problem is. There's always an attractant somewhere. Well, it's really my son's fault because I told him to put him in the garage and they didn't Fuzzy. do it. Uh-uh, you come pick uh, it up. That's what I told him. I said, he did it again, go pick it up. So. That attractant needs to be taken away. If it's garbage, they need to store their garbage in a different way. If it's a bird feeder, then they need to take that bird feeder down. If it's pet food on the porch, then they need to bring their pet food inside. There's always a solution to any attractant, and we address that first. If that does not stop the bear from coming, then we will set a trap. Public safety is tantamount, so if a bear gets out of hand, wildlife biologists try to teach them a lesson they'll never forget to make sure they keep their distance. Particularly unruly ones may be hazed with rubber bullets and dogs to instill a deep fear of humans. Hopefully that won't be necessary tonight, but Sophie is ready to help catch a repeat offender who's been causing problems for several area residents. Well, there's a bear here that um, is pretty trap shy, and so we put cameras around to try to pattern his movements between these neighborhoods. And then we're gonna, we have little blinds and, and different things that we'll be see, sitting either in trucks or in blinds, and then we're gonna try to free dart him. Keep your fingers crossed and hope he's in the right place at the right time. But, uh, you know, that's what you do. Trapping a bear requires a lot of reconnaissance, coordination, a little luck, and a ton of patience. Biologist Maria Davidson, Travis Trent, Michael Drury, and Travis Dufour load their dart guns, split up, hunker down at their stakeout locations, and wait, and wait, and wait. Several hours later, Maria gets a call. Well, if it looks like him, then I guess we're gonna call it in. Hey, I think our problem child is in the trap. And he seriously wants out. We believe that the bear that we caught in this trap is the bear that we were trying to free dart over on Leo and Kim. 
and it remains to be seen. We'll wait and see what the calls look like in the next couple of days. He'll be down in the next five or ten minutes and we'll work him up and put a collar on him and then transfer him. I am giving him some ear tags. He is going to be forevermore Bear 784. <gasps> that rhymes. <laughs> I'm easily impressed at this late at night. This sub-adult bear is about three to four years old and weighs over 200 pounds. Biologists use tattoos and microchips for identification and affix a radio collar to track his movements. That a sub-adult male bear tends to be pushed out of all of the best habitat by the adult males. So he's gonna have to find a new home range anyway. He would be one of those bears that's gonna travel great distances. You know, he can be in danger for crossing roads, things like that. So when we move him to an area that doesn't have a lot of bears, that the densities are very low, we're hoping he'll go ahead and settle down. This lady makes great hot chocolate. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very nice of you. Oh, Appreciate your generosity. Listen, I'm from New Orleans. I got that Southern hospitality. That's a good thing. <laughs> a few short hours later, Bear 784 is headed to his new home in Red River Wildlife Management Area. He's not happy. He rocked the truck for the most part all the way up here. So I think he's ready to get out and uh, go somewhere else and not have to deal with us anymore. If he decides to stop and turn back, take a shot into his rear end with that rubber buck shot. Anything could happen. And biologists and technicians are armed with non-lethal rubber bullets and bear spray, just in case. All right, we ready? All right, man. Come on, bear! Go! Go! Get out of there! Get out of here! Come on, let's go! Get! Go! Get! 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 Go! Go bear. Wildlife management areas like this one provide much needed refuge for countless species. But over 80% of Louisiana is privately owned. Bears need better quality habitat and the ability to travel safely between subpopulations to strengthen their gene pool and increase their chances for survival. Innovative federal initiatives like the USDA's Wetlands Reserve Program are enabling private citizens to help pave the way. The program pays landowners to restore wetlands and forests on their properties in exchange for long-term or perpetual conservation easements that prohibit them from converting that land back to agricultural use. That program targeted the biggest threat that sat out there for Louisiana black bear listing, which was loss of habitat and fragmentation of habitat. So that program has been huge, hundreds of thousands of acres uh, restored and protected. Nationwide, more than 11,000 private landowners have voluntarily converted over 2.6 million acres, improving their lands, watersheds, and local communities. Though counterintuitive for some, hunters are perhaps America's most aggressive conservationists. And for folks like the McGeehees, it's a sacred family tradition. This is Spring Bio, and Spring Bio is a, uh, a family heirloom, and uh, we are blessed by God to have this place, and uh, when you have a place like this, you have a responsibility to share it. There are things that you see at Spring Bio that you don't see in other places. Near the Tensaw National Wildlife Refuge in Madison Parish, Spring Bayou is roughly two square miles of forest, wetlands, and agriculture. We've owned this property since before I was born, uh, about 50, a little over 50 years. It was just a cornucopia of wildlife in Louisiana. It's basically the sportsman's paradise was here. Uh, growing up here as a child, there were hundreds and hundreds of deer. Through the years, we've seen a tremendous downward turn of the deer population and much of the wildlife in general. Bears, however, are making a comeback. Well, it was probably about 12 years ago where uh, it was exciting to see a bear. That was uh, a novelty, a very rare event that we would see. And more and more, we start seeing bears. 
uh, if you're a deer hunter, a, a, a bear and a deer are not going to interact. And that is a little disappointing for us. It's a lot of fun to see them, don't get me wrong, but whenever you see a bear, you're not going to see a deer. Although they don't like to mingle, bear and deer have similar habitat requirements and often coexist. So the McGeehees have called in the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries Deer Management Assistance Program to assess the health of the deer population and try to reverse this troubling trend. Much to their wives' chagrin, they're spending this Valentine's Day doing an infrared deer survey. Deep in the wilderness, in the dead of night, you never know quite what you're going to find. The water got a little too deep, <laughs> turning around. <laughs> First time tonight, <laughs> probably won't be the last. Managing wildlife populations is tricky. It's a delicate balance, often complicated by losses due to disease, predation, and Mother Nature herself. Only time will tell what the future holds for the wildlife here. But they're under close watch and in good hands. Louisiana is, is about the land, it's about uh, family, and you know, we take it upon ourselves, at least our family does, to uh, really build back in, let the kids experience it. Uh, we try to take care of the wildlife here because, as, as you see, we have four generations here, and we hope to have 14 generations here. A few hours south at Red River Wildlife Management Area, the LDWF team is inching closer to the sow they've been tracking, hoping to find healthy cubs. But to forge a path for the next generation of bears, they'll have to get past mama. Like most mothers, she won't give up without a fight and is standing her ground to protect them. It is dangerous work. Tensions mount as the sow hovers over her young, weakening from the effects of the tranquilizer. I'm worried about those cubs getting squished. She's sitting up over the cubs in order to fight them. Handling wild animals is not without a share of risk and may even seem cruel to some, but it is essential for their survival. Biological analysis and monitoring provide scientists with data on genetic diversity, growth, reproduction, and survival rates, and much needed insight for future management decisions about their recovery. We moved these bears to this part of the state in order to create a genetic bridge between Tensaw and Point Capi. And so what we're hoping is that the females here we're breeding with those point to pea males that will travel this far to find them, as well as the tensaw males that'll come down south. Bears mate in the summer months and give birth to less than a handful of cubs in the winter, usually two or three. Weighing just eight to 12 ounces at birth, cubs stay close to their mother throughout the first year. Their second spring, the males are edged out to find a home of their own, while the females set up camp near their mothers. Back in 2006, I did a den visit here, and I handled this bear as a three-pound cub, just as a little tiny baby. And then to get to handle her again with her own cubs is really pretty special. You know, as, as biologists, we manage a population of animals instead of individuals. But when you get in a situation like this, it's hard not to individualize them. It's pretty special. Well, you know, the hard side is actually, for me, is the computer work. There's hours and hours and hours in front of my computer doing analysis, doing the paperwork behind all of this. The field work is the best, but some of the field work can be really challenging. And there's lots of days where that are difficult to get through. Days like today, when all rehabilitation attempts have failed, public safety is at risk, and there are no other options. This is bear number 854. We had to track him down today using his radio collar and kill him. We went in with three people with shotguns with slugs and tracked him down and killed him in his day bed. And we had to do that because this bear was completely human habituated and food conditioned. Changing habits is tough for humans and bears are no different. They're gonna to go to the easy meal. It's what they do, it's in their best interest. They don't know that it's gonna to lead to their demise. They just know that they want to fill their belly. It's important that people go that extra step, 
you know, go that extra mile. For us to, as humans, decide, well, bears are supposed to be here, but it's a little inconvenient, so we're not going to have them, would be a horrible statement about our species. I just can't imagine people doing that. We can live with bears. There's no doubt in my mind that we can live with bears, but we need everybody's help to do it. We need to work together collectively, not only state agency and the federal agency, but everybody on the landscape. We can uh, affect change for fish and wildlife and, and for future generations. We can make a difference. The fact that we had them here and we brought them back from the brink of extinction, to bring them back to viability, I think is something that a lot of people here are and, and should be very proud of. And though there is still a long road ahead, this isn't the end of their story. It's just the beginning. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. This program was made possible by the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, keeping our wildlife resources healthy for future generations. Wildlife matters. And by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.